Look, I think the big thing with Takumi is he's one of the most intelligent players I've ever worked with. And, you know, I think that Alvar, um, they did a great job. Luca did a great job teaching him the disciplines of the game and, and particularly the disciplines of the pick and roll. And then what I was able to do when I got him to Shiga was really let him loose and give him more responsibility and let him make his own decisions and help teach him how to do that and get better. And I, so I think when you couple that disciplined uh, play he learnt from Tokyo and then you you bring him into where I'm a, more a, a coach that likes my point guards to make a lot of decisions on the on the court and I see it as my job to help teach that. Mm-hmm. Um, he's And with his basketball intelligence, it's really allowed him to blossom and, you know, he's really becoming just a fantastic leader. Hello, everybody. Good evening from Japan. You're listening to Sports Talk presented by Japan Forward. Uh, We've recently started doing the podcast on Twitter Spaces to have a live format where people can listen in as it's going on. And we will record the the episode and also post it on podcast platforms and on the Japan Forward and Sports Look websites. Tonight, we have a special guest from the B League, Nagoya Diamond Dolphins head coach, Sean Dennis. Good evening, coach. How are you today? I'm well, I'm well, and uh, thanks so much for having me on. Uh, I'm looking forward to having a good chat. You know, uh, Sean, I've followed your career a bit for the past few years in Japan, where you worked previously for the uh, Tochigi Brex and then the Shiga Lake Stars, and this season uh, with, with the Nagoya Diamond Dolphins. Can you give our listeners a bit of background on your career before Japan as a player and coach? And what led to those stops that you had previously uh, in the B League? Uh, for sure, for sure. Um, I was uh, I started playing in the Australian NBL in 1986, and I played through until 1995. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that time, the last head coach I had was actually uh, Tom Wisman, mm. who was the, the head coach at Tochigi Brex when I was there, and is now the head coach at Goodmar. Right, and. Uh, Tom actually left and I became an assistant coach later in late in my playing career. So for the last three years as a player, mm-hmm. I was uh, vid- our video technician and uh, that was back in the days of two VCRs and you know, not, not quite like the software we have today with all the computers and all that yeah. sort of stuff. And then I had one year as a lead assistant coach with Tom and then Tom left Newcastle and moved to Japan to be with uh, Isuzu uh, back mm-hmm. in 1997, I think it was, mm-hmm. and actually 1998. And uh, I took over as head coach of Newcastle. I was a very young and inexperienced head coach. Um, then I was an assistant coach at Illawarra after being a head coach for three years. Then I headed off to New Zealand as a head coach. Then I came back to Australia Um and was with the West Sydney Razorbacks slash Sydney Spirit. While mm-hmm. still head coaching in New Zealand, I was able to do both jobs. Uh, then I ended up moving to Perth as an assistant coach with my good friend Rob Beveridge um, in 2010. And then in 2013, I got the head coaching job in Townsville, with the Townsville Crocodiles, where I was there for three years. And, uh, you know, we, we had a very good young young side and, after the third year, we'd build it up similar to what we did in Shiga after three years. And then, uh, unfortunately, the team in Townsville uh, went bankrupt and I just re-signed um, and was fortunate enough to get coach of the year. We had a terrific young team that was really evolving and uh, mm-hmm. uh, had no job. So I was lucky enough, uh, my friend recommended me to do a coaching clinic over here in Japan with, uh, you know, they have the, the licenses now to coach in Japan. And uh, so mm-hmm. myself and Luca, who's now coach of uh, Tokyo, um, came over. We were the first two coaches to do the S license clinic. And from there, um, Tom contacted me just after I got back to Australia uh, from doing that clinic and told me that they had an assistant coach's position available at Tochigi. And would I be interested? As you knew, I didn't have a job at that time, and and 
I jumped at the opportunity and, you know, we, we had a, an amazing year that for, that year in uh, Tochigi, which was also the first year of uh, – the first official year of the B-League. Mm-hmm. And we, we won the championship and from there I got the opportunity to become a head coach at Chiga and had four years there and then um, last year Nagoya approached me about joining uh, them and, you know, I jumped at the opportunity and you know, I had a couple of ex-players here from Chiga and uh, that's how I ended up in Nagoya. You know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll rewind a bit uh, as we progress in the conversation. Okay. Uh, some of the points that you made, but for our listeners and people that will find this program and, you know, in the weeks and months to come, uh, tell us about your playing career. What, 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 what kind of player were you like your personality and what position did you play? Uh, for me, you know, uh, you know, I was a kid who, you know, played all sports as a kid coming up and I actually didn't play basketball for two years. Um, while I was, taken down to Melbourne for Australian rules football and Mm -hmm. but my first love was always basketball so in the end that didn't work out and uh, Mm -hmm. so I went back to school and I started playing basketball and uh, back in basketball and I was playing in the second division uh, which back then was called the Southeastern Australian Basketball League and Mm -hmm. I got recruited to the Newcastle Falcons in 1986. Mm -hmm. Um, I was only 20 years old. I was a point guard. was a pretty pretty good shooter in my day. Um, was a was a pretty good athlete as a younger player, but as as I got a bit older, my injury started to to knock me back a bit. So I would say I was a, a heady player, and you know, a, a, a guy who understood the game and and had a pretty good basketball IQ. So it was almost a natural progression that I would go into coaching, and and you know, towards the end of my career, it was about night end of nineteen ninety two. I was with the Newcastle Falcons, and I could I knew my playing days were pretty much numbered. You know, my my knees were pretty done, and uh, you know, it was getting more and more difficult just to keep myself in the right shape, just to make the court and. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd, I'd sort of become a backup to the American American point guards that were all in Australia at that time. And uh, I approached the, the club and Tom about moving into the coaching and we, we had a couple of voids. One, we didn't do a lot of video work, so I saw that as an avenue to get started. And uh, so that was how I got into coaching. Do you, do you think that your coaching style and your, your mental approach to coaching is similar to what was your playing style? I do because um, I was a very passionate player. You know, I gave everything I had on the court. Uh, you know, I was aggressive and, um, you know, I, I really left everything out there. And I think, you know, coaching-wise, I'm, I'm very passionate and, you know, I set very high standards and, and you know, I ask of myself to achieve those high standards first and foremost. And, uh, and then obviously I challenge the players and and the other staff members to to reach those standards and uh you know I'm very big on 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 discipline and and really pushing yourself and and seeing if you can find you know that that getting yourself out of your comfort zone and finding finding that thing that drives you to be the best you can be and mm-hmm. you know that was how I was as a player and I think I got pretty much everything out of myself as I could. You know, you always look back sometimes and go, gosh, if I knew this back then and that. But uh, I thought I got as much out of myself as I could. You know, I had a few very good years, but then, I said, as I said, you know, injury started to really slow me down a bit and uh, I just became a serviceable backup. And uh, But, you know, as a, as a coach, I tried to put that same passion and energy into into my coaching as I did as a player. What was your biggest thrill? Uh, as a player, um, to be honest, my biggest thrill was just being able to do what I loved and be able to do that every day. You know, we—I was never lucky enough to win a championship as a player, but you know, we made some playoffs. Um, mm-hmm. And just you know, as a kid, you, you grew up dreaming of. And one of my dreams was to play sport for a living, and and that was my profession. And to have that opportunity and to be able to get to do that every day and and the camaraderie and you, that you build with your teammates and that being able to compete was just I just loved it and I still love it to today you know I love mm-hmm. just competing it's it's 
almost my biggest thrill as a coach too is just that that being able to compete and go up mm. against the best. You know, you know, if I use that, uh, you know, last weekend playing against uh, Ruku, um, mm-hmm. you know, the weekend before, and and to go down there and you know the first game they they really they monstered us and beat us by 30 points, but to be able to go back and compete and, and find a way to win the next day, to me, that was always the greatest thrill as a player as well, was finding ways to to be able to compete against the best, that, you know, that, that was on offer every week. I'd like to point out just for a moment that the game you were referring to, the rematch on April 17th was a one-point win, yes. 81-80 for Nagoya. And – even more significant, I think, was the fact that it ended the Golden Kings' 13-game winning streak. It was, you know, and, and you want to measure yourself against the best all the time. I think that's a, a great driver to have inside you, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and and they have been by far been the best team this year, you know. And you, you, you'd have to sit here and say they're probably favourites, mm-hmm. you know, but with uh, to win the championship. And, you know, to be able to go down there and show – and particularly after what they did to us the day before, and they're very driven right now. And to go out the next day and and, and watch the guys learn that lesson from the day before was, uh, you know, as I said, that just that's the thing I love about sport and being able to compete all the time. Okay, let's uh, let's switch topics for a couple moments here and narrow in on the 2016-17 season with the with the Brex. Um, you were reunited with your former coach, Tom Weissman. You were in a new role in a new league. I believe you had sort of the title of defensive coordinator or you were in charge of the defensive game plan for the Brex that season. It, and how how special was that for the team to, you know, come in, come, enter a new league with a lot of new teams before the merge, you know, that were from the old BJ league before the merger and the scouting is a lot different from the old NBL. There are a lot of different players that nobody's ever seen. And week to week, month to month, you guys uh, put together a special season and then defeated the Brave Thunders, Kawasaki, in the finals. It it was um, it was a really special year for me because to to join back up with Tom was amazing. You know, Tom was a mentor for me. He gave me my first coaching opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and, and to this day, I still use drills and different things that he taught me, you know, 26 years ago, uh, back in the early nineties, you know, 28 can you years give ago. One, can you give one or two quick examples of that without, yeah, you know, for was, sure. you know I've, yeah, I've always believed that Tom was a master at, uh, you know, looking at a team and, and working out ways to be able to challenge them and and defeat them and you know he taught me a lot about being able to how to scout a team and how to look at that team and you know then to be able to come back and join him and show him how far I'd grown as a coach we hadn't worked together for uh gosh it was 1996 97 was the last year we worked together so mm. it was pretty much 20 years later to the day we joined we joined up again and mm. I think it was a great honor for me to do that but also I think he was very proud to have me join and to see how far I'd grown as a coach and as a person and uh you know it's uh it was just so much fun to to come into a whole new environment and and to have to scout all these new players, you know, and I spent countless hours, particularly on the individual scouts, and uh, you know, offering my, I guess, expertise um, on, on the different individuals in the leagues, and, and and you know, it was it was just a lot of fun, and to work work with Onzai as well as the other assistant coach, who's now the head coach of Woodson on Mia Brex. It was just we we just we hit it off pretty much straight away, and uh, I, I think. Between the three of us, we we made such a great coaching, you know, had such a great coaching staff. I, I would guess that uh, not being a coach, but being a journalist and someone that looks at box scores, you know, to write reports that if you're doing an entirely new set of opponents, at least half of the teams, that the scouting work that season would probably be a lot harder than other seasons in making your game plan because of the so much newness to what you guys were facing. It, it really was, um, and, and that's why I took. You know, I watched hours. You know, we're very lucky 
in today's world with all the uh, software and technology we have, um, mm-hmm. you know, it makes your life a lot easier. You know, we have what we call synergy sports where you can pretty much bring up everyone's information um, from about the last six, six or seven years. So that allowed me to be able to go on there and really study and and look at the different teams and, and see what, you know, and, and obviously Tom and, and Onsai really helps me a lot as well. Um in terms of being able to talk to them about the different teams and coaches and, and what styles they had and then being able to share the information together, you know, it, it made our, our jobs a lot easier, that's for sure. Okay. Going going back to that season, uh, one more moment here. Um, you know, you were around day to day. You were around the Utah Tabuse, the guard, first mm-hmm. NBA player from Japan who has been, you know, a mainstay with the uh, the Breck since 20, 2008 when he returned. Um, do you happen to have a favorite story that kind of helps illustrate that he really is a rock star throughout Japan, wherever wherever there's a gym and where there's a basketball or where there's fans? What sort of illustrates that from what you've seen? Well, it, it what the first thing that illustrates is that no matter where we played, uh, it was a sellout crowd. And, um, you know, he... Everywhere we went, you know, we, you know, you catch the the Shinkansen, and you know, he has to wear a mask and <laughs> and hide his face because the moment somebody recognizes him, you know, before he blinks, he's got you know twenty, thirty people around him, and it was just it's not something I'd ever experienced before that you know he had to sort of quietly move around without making too much noise because as soon as somebody recognized him, uh, fans would come from everywhere, you know, and, and after games we would, you know, he was, he's the most professional athlete I've ever seen in terms of his routines before and after games, before and after practice. And, uh, you know, everywhere we had to go, you know, the media wanted to talk to him. The fans wanted to some of him. And so we – sometimes it could be, you know, an hour and a half to two hours after games before we actually got, we got to leave on the bus, particularly when we're on the road, you know. And uh, it, it's it's just something I've never experienced before. I mean, he – and as a player, wow, you know, smart, great leader, you know, always pushing – uh, practiced as hard as he played and it was just a joy to work with. It, it seems from watching him over the years that he's very, very important in being a mentor to the younger Japanese players, not only because they idolize him, but they see the work that he puts in. A hundred percent. You know, I have uh, Utaro Suta playing for me here in Nagoya now, and he was with us in, at the Brex that first year. Right, and I watch some of the things he does before and after games, and they are all he learned all of it from Tabase, you know, and you just see that influence he has, and it's just incredible. And you know, I, I hope in years to come he's able to, you know, once he does stop playing, that he he does have that opportunity to to continue to share his knowledge and experience with a lot of the younger players coming through because he really does give a lot back to those players that are around him and talking to them and leading them and teaching them. And, uh, you know, for us as a coaching staff, it was like having an extra coach on the floor. He, he was that good. Looking at the league as a whole, just looking at the structure of the Japan Basketball Association in 2022, if we think back to 2016, when the league was just starting up uh, to where it is now with the structure of the first, second and third divisions, how much growth has the league made in terms of um, strengthening the quality of play and the maybe the business synergy and the promotional apparatus it, from what you've observed? Um, look, I think that the level of play has improved uh, dramatically. Um, when I came here and, and particularly when I became a head coach, and you start trying to recruit players into Japan, you know, most of the players that were made available were players who were more towards the end of their careers. You know, they're starting to get in around that 32, 33 year mark and they've, they've had their foray in Europe or tried the NBA and, um, mm-hmm. you know, they saw Japan as a sort of a retirement 
situation where you come and get a few more extra years out of your body. You don't have to practice hard. You don't have to play hard. And, you know, there, but in that time, we're now seeing players in their prime wanting to come to Japan. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a much, uh, you know, the quality of the coaching. And I think that's credit to the JBA with the S license clinic and the coach education that's going on. Um, and, and, and the influence of some of the foreign coaches who are now in the league has seen the quality of play and the, and the style change. You know, when we arrived, it was a lot of low post type play and, um, you know, a lot of teams except for the, the, the very good teams relied on their Americans quite a lot you know we've seen that the the local players now are playing bigger roles in a lot more teams you know, there's more movement the, the the pace of the game's getting a lot quicker you know this the, the scoring is actually increasing i think overall there's more mm-hmm. teams averaging in the 80s now you know the 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 game plans and the strategies are a lot uh i, I feel are getting more, um, what would you say, you know, there, there's a lot more to them, you know, and, and the schemes are a lot better, so you've got to work a lot harder. Uh, it's fun watching some of these young Japanese coaches and how they're starting to evolve with all of this. And, you know, you know we play Shinshu tomorrow, and I think Michael's done an amazing job at, at Shinshu. And, you know, every time you play them, he, he, he forces you to have to really coach very hard and make a lot of adjustments and I think that's been a lot of fun to watch and now when you recruit players you know the agents want to talk about their better players and you know I think the, the money in the league has increased as the popularity's increased you know and 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 the goals that they've set for the league you know are, are fantastic so it's it's growing and growing and growing and you know I get calls from other countries now asking about the league you know there's a lot more foreign coaches wanting to get into Japan because they see the growth and the potential that's ahead personally I think uh, one of the better examples of a player who's in their prime like you said a good good overseas player uh, I would look at a guy like um, Sebastian Saiz, the, the yes. Spaniard who, yes. who has played with uh, the Chiba Jets, and he's with the Alvark now. He started out with the Sun Rockers. Yep. Uh, this is his third team now, but I mean, he's in his late twenties now, but clearly one of the you know best all around players. And he began his career in Spain, which, as you know, is a really good basketball country. Exactly, you know, and uh, he is in his prime, you know. And then you can look at you know Jack Cool. He's come in at you know in his prime. Uh, Dwayne Evans has come in his prime. Right. I look at uh, the big kid we've got, Scott Ethan, and was in Spain and could have gone back, but has come in, he's, you know, he's only 29, he's in his prime. And and they're the sort of guys that weren't coming, you know, in that first year, uh, that level who were playing, you know, Euro Euro League basketball. And, and now we're getting those players coming in, you know, and I think, you know, I spoke to an agent today and, and, you know, he basically said, you know, I've got some high-level European guys that really want to get into Japan. And that's that's testament to the growth of the league and, you know, and not just the quality of, and, and the higher quality imports we get in than the higher quality of basketball. And that's only going to improve the quality of the locals. And, you know, and I, I look back at Australia and, you know, when it, it really peaked in the 90s and now it's, it's getting back to that sort of peak. One of the biggest things was the quality of Americans that were coming in, which were forcing the local players to have to lift their standard, and and that's what you get when you get better quality players playing. When you when you look at the landscape of international basketball leagues, is there a league that you think Japan is quite similar to on the like ranking scale or just the competition level? Um, you know, I I, I don't think it's as I'd be really interested now to see some of the top teams um, go to Australia and, and maybe play in a preseason tournament just to see mm-hmm. where it stands, you know. But I definitely think this league is is starting to pass and get better than probably Korea. And, you know, I, I, I feel it's, it's starting to, you know, I think we could take teams to some of those lower-level European leagues and, and, and we'd do very well. Um, in those leagues, so you know, I'd, I'd really love to to for for the top teams to go down to Australia for the preseason and and see how we fare against some of the Australian teams because I really do think that the top teams would do very well down there and and they wouldn't be the easy beats. And I remember when I played back in the nineties, we played some of the 
uh, Isuzu come down and, and you know, we would beat them quite easily. And I don't know that it would be that easy anymore. You know, I, I think the top teams in Australia would still be probably be a, a little bit too strong. But I, I think, you know, the top teams would could compete with those middle-ranked teams in Australia, which is just a great sign for the, the game in this country. You know, and the the evolution of the uh, regional basketball also will, will involve uh, the East Asia Super League coming up where teams from Japan will also face teams from the Philippines and Hong Kong and elsewhere. So that will be another test. Well, I, I think it's it's going to be great, you know, to, you know, you look at the population throughout Asia and, and, and the popularity of basketball uh, to start something like that. Uh, I, I really think it's just going to help grow it and, and the amount of people that's going to reach, you know, can only be also great for the business part of it as well. And I think that's what's important that as the as the, the level of play increases and, and, and the, we start to reach out further that we can also grow up from a business point of view to make sure that financially it can support all of that. Okay. I'd like to ask you a few questions about the Diamond Dolphins and, you know, make sure. some general observations and let you react uh, over the next few moments. <laughs> no um, okay. Entering entering tomorrow's game, you mentioned uh, Shinshu. Uh, you're playing the Brave Warriors tomorrow against Michael Katsuhisa's team. Mm. Uh, currently, you are the, the t- you, I should say the team. <laughs> the team is 30, 30 and 13, uh, third mm. place in the Western Conference, winner of four games in a row. Uh, you've clinched a playoff spot in the West. Uh, what do you believe are the team's strengths as a group and individual strengths as well? Okay, one of our strengths as a group is, um, you know, this we've worked very hard to build a, a a good culture of hard work and you know being accountable and responsible for your performance. And the guys have done a great job of buying into that. And you know, with that, you know, we we talked about. Uh, one of our goals was to average 90 points a game, and I think right now we sit at about 89 points. Uh, dropped off a little bit, and I think that's had to do with the breaks through COVID and just the uh, uncertainty over the last two months. It's been a real challenge, but you know I really like the pace we play with. You know we talked about being a team that's going to be disruptive on defense, and you know we we throw a lot of different defenses at you and make you have to adjust and change, and I think that's. That's been a real key and, and one of the things we wanted to put together as a group was a very mobile group. So <clears throat> we wanted to be a little bit different, not have that real traditional centre and Scott Ethan has been just terrific in that in that role. Um, he's very mobile and, you know, we play off a lot of player movement and I think, you know, as a group we've done that fantastically. It looks from what I've seen from highlights and, and you know, studying the statistics that – you also place a real big emphasis on unselfish play on offense. And and one reason I point that out is you have five guys averaging two or more assists. Um, Scott Etherding, Cody Clark, Ray Parks Jr. from the Philippines, Tatsuya Ito, and of course, number one on the team in assist, uh, Takumi Saito, who's at 5.9. How is that going to help the offense really just, you know, stay in sync, that, that approach? Well, you know, one of the you know I've always been uh, a, a believer in you know not just relying on one or two people um, to do you know majority of the the heavy lifting, and you know one of the things we wanted to put together a group that, as I said, was very mobile and and could all move and pass the ball and shoot the ball and you know last year I think nine of our players shot over forty percent from the three point line you know and it hasn't gone that completely that way but we're one of the better three-point shooting teams and and we talk about uh giving up good for great you know and and I think that's one of the big things that our players have really bought into and that togetherness and 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 the players realize too that the leading players will still get majority of the shots because that's just the way it works and you know in the recruiting process that was one of the things we wanted the players to understand that, you know, you have to understand I'm not going to just run set plays for you to go one-on-one or do your thing. We're a five-man offensive team. We're, we're movement, you know, and if you don't think you could fit into that, then this won't be the place for you. And all of our players have really bought into that. <clears throat> and, you know, what's helped is that Takumi and Yusuke Carino played for me in Shiga, so they were able to help me sell that. 
And and what we've seen is other players now play bigger roles and start to really enjoy that part of the game. And when you're enjoying that side of it, it's very easy to play together and want to share the ball around with each other. Saito is number three in the league in total assists. Uh, I think I mentioned that, 5.9. So the only two guys ahead of him, um, Perrin Buford of Shimane at 6.0 and Chiba star Yuki Togashi at 6.5. How, how do you see the career path that he is taking? Uh, I'm referring to Saito here. Yes, how has he developed and matured over the last few years? You know, I saw him play as a very young kid at the Albark, and he was clearly, he had the talent and the, you know, motivation and the hard work to be a good player. And he's certainly elevated his game the last couple of years. Look, I think the big thing with Takumi is he's one of the most intelligent players I've ever worked with. And, you know, I think that Alvar, um, they did a great job. Luca did a great job teaching him the disciplines of the game and, and particularly the disciplines of the pick and roll. And then what I was able to do when I got him to Shiga was really let him loose and give him more responsibility and let him make his own decisions and help teach him how to do that and get better. And I, so I think when you couple that disciplined uh, play he learnt from Tokyo and then you you bring him into where I'm a, more a, a coach that likes my point guards to make a lot of decisions on the on the court, and I see it as my job to help teach that. Mm-hmm. Um, he's and with his basketball intelligence, it's really allowed him to blossom, and you know he's really becoming just a fantastic leader. And I, I think over the next two years, you're going to see him just grow even even more. You know, and he's, he's probably going to get some opportunities at the international level now with the national team. And and the better players he plays against, the smarter he's going to get and working out how to how he can make a contribution. And you know, that's the greatest thing with him. You know, and I look at the the last few weekends, he, he's just been outstanding. And uh, you know, and I and I love that about him. You know, he's he's getting smarter and smarter, and and, and realizing more and more how he can be a major contributor. And I think, you know, that's just going to keep growing. He's, he's still got a lot of growth left in there. You were mentioning uh, briefly about, about uh, Saito being, uh, you know, you know, average size or maybe a little below average size. And in, in, yep. in some, in some cases for, if you think of a point guard, 172 centimeters, but he's a very smart point guard and he's coming off a really nice game where he had 16 points and matched his season high with nine assists on Sunday. So your your point about him really playing well in recent weeks, I think that's correct. Yeah, look, he he's you know, he, I think sometimes you know, in terms of size, etc., we get a little caught up with that in basketball. And you know, at the end of the day, I, I think you've got to say, you know, can this guy play? You know, is he a player? And and Saito's a player, you know, and. He, the more he plays, the more he works out how to overcome, you know, you, you, you learn how to overcome your limitations and, and how to play to your strengths, you know, and his strengths, you know, his ability to play with the with ball, how to get the right angles coming off pick and rolls and, um, you know, get himself into the right spots where he can, uh, you know, make an impact in the game uh, is something he's getting better and better at. And, you know, the more responsibility he gets. And the thing I love about him most is, too, he wants that responsibility. And that's mm-hmm. that's part of the battle. Sometimes players say they want it, but you watch them and they don't really want that responsibility. But he doesn't shy away from any of that. And, you know, he loves that responsibility and taking big shots and, and making, you know, having the ball in his hands to make the play. And, he, you know, so, and players who do that, put themselves in a vulnerable position, uh, you know, because they're going to get crit- criticised at different times. Um, but with him, you know, he's a smart kid who's learning more and more and, and, you know, he knows when to shoot it, when to pass it. And, you know, this year, you know, at different times he's made such big plays, whether it for, be for himself or for others at, at crucial times. Brief, Briefly, can you comment on the – your general impressions about – Tatsuya Ito, uh, Taito Naka, Nakahigashi, and Tenketsu Harimoto, three of your uh, more well-known Japanese veterans on the team. Well, you know, if we start with Tatsuya, you know, when when I heard that he was interested in coming, you know, I said to the club, well, I would love him because, 
his ability to put pressure on the ball is amazing. And, you know, he, he's just uh, like a little bulldog. He just really uh, gets after it. And I love that toughness about him. And, you know, I played against him while I was at Shiga for so long. And to now coach him is a lot of fun. And, you know, the big thing that I'm, I'm, I'm having fun watching him grow as a point guard, you know, one of the reasons he came here was he, he felt at times uh, he wasn't given those opportunities that the Americans, you know, he played with Julian Mavunga at, at, um, at, at Kyoto and then he went to Osaka and, and DJ Newbel was there and he felt right. like he wasn't being given those responsibilities. And, you know, I, as I said to him, well, with me, you're going to have those responsibilities because I'm a believer in that. And uh, he's really enjoying that, you know, and, and for us it's just coming up with ways where he can – also be a real uh, a real contributor on offense and, and we've been able to do that and, you know and at different times he comes up with big offensive plays and I, I just love the kid uh, with Taito you know I think he's a, a a player who's a very good athlete great instincts and anticipation and so he really suits our pressing defense and you know has a real ability to get to the basket and the thing I see with him and I see it with a lot of Japanese players or a lot of local players that if they make a couple of mistakes, they tend to go into their shell. So I've tried to work really hard this year to really encourage him to keep going and keep trying things. And um, mm -hmm. I'm watching him evolve and, you know, I don't think he realises how good he could be yet. You know, he's, he's got a very good shot technique. You know, he just needs to put in the work. And, uh, you know, defensively, I think he has the potential to be one of the best on-ball defenders in the league, if not the best. You know, he's got long arms and – great lateral movement, great just natural instincts uh, and anticipation. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really hopeful over the next year or two he's going to just continue to evolve and we'll, we'll keep, continue to try and evolve and, and have him play a bigger role uh, in our team, particularly on the offensive end. And I think with Harry Moto, you know, I feel that he's a kid that a, a, a little untapped as well and I think at times – he probably is a little bit laid back, but, you know, this year we've started to see him get a little bit more consistent in his play and, and, and to play a bigger role. And, you know, for me, he's so versatile because he can play on the wing or he can play in the, in the, in the forward spot. So it gives us great versatility. And, and I think one of the greatest compliments to him was actually playing against Ryukyu. They didn't really play their big lineup against us. And mm -hmm. I thought that was, uh, that was credit to him. And then when we, we beat Kawasaki the first day. In the second day, they beat us, but they didn't play their big lineup. And I thought that was credit to he's he's the way he's evolved this year and playing a bigger role in that three four spot. You know, there are certain there are a few teams around the league that have a big following in the Philippines because of a, a Filipino player on the squad. Uh, how how much attention have you observed that is both for media and maybe the fan interest uh, in the Diamond Dolphins because of Ray Parks Jr. being there. Oh, uh, it's it's huge. You know, I'm watching that too with uh, uh, Kai Soto, who's playing in Australia, and you know, and, and the the other Filipino kids that are playing in our league now. And you know, I was lucky enough to go to the Philippines in 1988, and I actually played against Ray's father, uh, oh, yeah? Bobby Ray Parks Senior. Yes, <laughs> Tom Wisman actually tried to recruit. Uh, his father to Australia, but uh, we couldn't compete with the money that he was making in the Philippines. So, you know, he stayed in the Philippines. And, um, you know, the, the the following was amazing. I, and that was the first time I really experienced such parochial support for basketball uh, was in the Philippines. And I actually was going to try and recruit Ray to Australia uh, when I was with the Townsville Crocodiles uh, until they went bankrupt. So I've been aware of Ray for quite some time. So to get the opportunity to recruit him this year and to have him with us, uh, you know, into the future was a really big, big for me because I think he's another kid that, like uh, Taito, he, he's not realised his potential yet. You know, we're only seeing scratching the surface with how good he's going to become, I think, over the next couple of years. And, and I think it's a great thing for us as a league to have that that support from the Philippine fan base because that can only help help grow the business side of it as well. 
How is how is uh, how is Parks played this season? Uh, what's your evaluation of his performance? I think he's been terrific. You know, we, you know, you look at it and you can have either a, a player under the Asian rule or you can have a changed nationality player. And um, we chose to pursue Ray, and and you know, I think he's he's he's, he's not exceeded my expectations. I always thought he'd be talented, um, but I think he's exceeded a lot of expectations and has played fantastic, you know, and he's been a major contributor to a lot of our wins. And I think as his consistency grows and as he works out how we can find his spots in our in our system and, and become a more consistent defender, he's only going to get better and better. But I, I've been very, very happy with his play. You had the split um, just a, just a, two weeks ago against, against the uh, Golden Kings. So they're they're going to be coming up against again for you guys uh, before the season ends uh, this Saturday and Sunday. Do, do you, how important is that as a measuring stick, or do you kind of view it differently? Maybe after beating them in a bounce back game on the seventeenth. Yeah, it's look. They are the measuring stick. So you want to know you can go in there and compete. You know, and obviously the first day when we play them, we didn't, and you know we we were embarrassed with our performance and you know i think that's the important thing is that that we have a style we want to play and you want to measure that against the best and the second day we measured up well against them you know but they're going to want revenge so i think it's a great measure for us to go into those games um to see they're going to come back. They're going to want revenge. Can we go with them again? Can we compete with that level? And and what do you learn from that? And and that's something we talk about a lot. You know, what did we learn? You know, every game, whether we win or lose. You know, when we played Kawasaki, it was similar. You know, when we played the Brex, you know, all these teams, Shimane, these 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 top teams. How are we competing with them? You know, are we moving in the right direction? And that, and that's really. And now that we're qualified for the playoff, I think is the most important thing for us. How do we find a way that if we meet these guys in the postseason that we can compete with them and give ourselves the best chance to win? So it is an important series. Uh, of course. And you're viewing it, of course, in a way of motivating your team, but also as a measuring stick, as you just pointed out. Absolutely. You know, whenever you play, you know, this this team has – this is the first time uh, – you know, the, the, the Dolphins will be back in the playoffs in three years, you know, and I think in the five years of the league, you know, this is the six years they've only been in the playoffs once. So how do we become consistent like Riku who have won five Western championships? You know, how do we do that? How do we become a team that can be considered one of the top five, six teams every year in the league? And and that's really our major goal right now. We need to we need to find a way to get that consistency so that this is just not a one off. And and that's and they're the teams you've got to look at and, and find out what do they do well and what can we take from them that, that we can apply to what we do. How where can we improve in our own systems to be better so that we become that consistent force year in, year out. Hmm. Well, I appreciate uh, many, many opportunities, many, many comments today on many topics. Wide ranging uh, discussion here, Coach. Uh, it's been very fun and very in- enlightening, I think. I uh, hope uh, you enjoyed it as well. Uh, it's a pleasure, Ed. You know, I could talk about this this beautiful game that's been my life for so long now, for hours and hours and hours. So <laughs> it's always a pleasure. Let's uh, let's 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 take a time out from that uh, permanent conversation and uh, you know, pick it up another day. Sounds fantastic. Okay, thanks again for your time and have a pleasant evening. You too, Ed. Cheers.